Welcome to Revelation Reimagined. We are in session eight. Can you believe it? What does this prophetic book of Revelation say about the end times and the end of the world? What is it all about? And how does it speak to our lives today? These are some of the things we explore together in this online exploration and discussion of this great book of Revelation. Joining me on the panel to my left is Roman Halupka. To his left is Peter Hughes, and at the far end, Michael Nahanu. My name is Darren Croft. We are four Seventh-day Adventist pastors who love to read and study and discuss the book of Revelation. Last session, we were in Revelation chapter 13, where we got to see the dark methods, the counterfeits of Satan revealed and how the beasts that are under his influence work. And now as we move into Revelation 14, it's actually a continuation of what we got in chapter 13, but in place of the darkness of Revelation 13, we now enter into this bright light of hope with three messages that come from God, and that's what we are about to discuss. But before we get to that, we look at the opening verses of Revelation 14. I hope you've had a chance to read through the chapter if you haven't. Press pause now and go and have a read of the chapter and then come back and join us again. So, gentlemen, Revelation chapter 14, it actually doesn't open with the three angels' messages. It opens with a picture of a group of people that we've met before. Who are these people? The 144,000 who are part of a great multitude. We met them in Revelation chapter 7. And there is some confusion sometimes as to the 144,000. But in broad terms, the 144,000 are the people who have, during each age, during each time, stood for the truth of God. And then the, the last of these people are going to be the people that feature in chapter 14. Mm. So these are, in terms of their characteristics, they're essentially the, the same as the great multitude. It's just yes. there's an extra descriptor mm. that they're the first fruits. They're the first fruits. Yeah. Each age has their first fruits. And when you put them together, it becomes a great multitude. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Mm. Michael? I think this um, uh, introductory uh, passage in uh, chapter 14, it's a sneak peek. All no, right? so, we, so, so we need a bit of hope here. <clears throat> we can't take it as a chronological, and now as some Bible commentators they will say that, you know, the church is in heaven now, and everything that follows is just disaster and punishing and whatever. Um, it's a sneak peek, as, uh, and we have this in the Bible all the time when when the, the um, misery, the human misery that we are living in, and then the, the promises of God that come. You know, when Jesus was still with the disciples and uh, he gave them the promise, I will come back. Do yeah. not let your hearts be troubled. I will come back. So this is a kind of a sneak peek of, of the future, the glorious future that is awaiting for God's people while we are still here. Because if we don't have this understanding, what follows after the three angels' messages, they, they don't make sense. Mm. Now, now, I think it was you, Michael, in one of our discussions, brought out that there's some military language connected to this 144,000. Yeah, so I, I think it's, it's important to remind ourselves, um, because the, the temptation is here to consider 144 as a literal number. And then we fall into into that trap of limiting, and it's like if yeah, and yeah. I heard you're, this, you're part of it. I'm not. Yeah, why was me? Yeah. yeah, I heard this this uh, question again, and again. So if there is one forty four plus one, God will say no, 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 because you are uh, you are not accepted into this. Mm. So we we see in in uh, back in Israel, uh, a military unit was made up of a thousand people. So now it's multiplied uh, with 12 and 12, and we, we get a number of 144,000. So what I would say, this is the name of God's army. So when we read in chapter 7, actually, we are given every single tribe with the number 12,000. 
uh, and we know that God is looking at his people like an army. So as we are com coming closer to the, the final war, Armageddon, that we are going to discuss about, Satan is preparing his troops. And we have, have already come across that the number of Satan's military army, the number, it's just... Uh, and then God is preparing his army in the final con confrontation that will take place there. And Peter... He wants something, something to say. <laughs> Peter, <Rainer. laughs> Well, I just wanted to add to what you were saying, Michael. You, you're very correct. The, this, but there are two periods of time when God raises up two different armies. The first was a physical army that he mm. raised. And when they went to war against the enemy that God had determined was an enemy, not one person died. Mm. So that... Everyone returned, and that and that age is often associated with the nation of Israel, yeah. the twelve tribes. But after the cross, we've still got twelve to to multiply together with what happened in the first period. And in that period, it is the twelve churches raised by the disciples. Mm -hmm. And each of those in each of those ages, when those disciples go out to do their work. There will be 144,000. There will be people who are standing as an army of God to fight the battles of truth. So we, we see here a continuity between the Old Testament and New Testament. There is yes. no any fraction um, between between no. you know God's truth. God's truth has been always yeah. the same. So God's God's um, uh, champions in the Old Testament are the same with God's champions in the New Testament. They are part of the same army. 12 Around is just a way of communicating this is God's kingdom. Correct. It's a kingdom number. Correct. Yes. Roman, did you want to add to that one? Yes, I would like to add who are those people, not only the soldiers in the army, but they are pure. They are sinless this moment. And it is written that there was no <clears throat> found in them the guile, or it's in my notes here, it's written, you know, the falsehood. falsehood. So, so it means they, they are followers of Jesus, so they are saints. Yes. So in this way, all the saints are there, you know, in this number of 144,000, because there, were, there was just such a battle in front of my eyes, you know, as you mentioned, the army, and it's true, we know, but, you know, but they are victorious people. Yeah. Now, now before, we, before we move on from this, I just want to tackle one thing. Using military language can sometimes be a bit of a fraught exercise. Mm -hmm. What do we mean when we talk about the army of God? Yeah, so that, that's actually what I wanted to say. So we are not talking about weapons, like physical weapons and uh, ammunition. So, so we're not talking a literal showdown <laughs> yes, in some nothing. country in the Middle East it's or anything like nothing that? Nothing about that. It, it's all spiritual. It's only spiritual realm. All right? have so the that, that is a superior type yeah. of battle, and that is the real battle. And the Apostle Paul actually tells us that we are not uh, uh, fighting against blood and, and flesh, but against the principalities. So it's, it's a spiritual battle, uh, and that battle, we, we perceive it, and we experience it, every single one of us. Yeah. And God says, you are my soldier in this battle. So if and you stand firm to the truth of God, you are a soldier in that army. Absolutely. So the truth is, is, is uh, uh, very important uh, prayer is very important studying is very important when we study the bible when we tell other people about christ this is what it means to be in the soldier a soldier in god's army yeah and we have the armor of god that apostle paul has written about it uh, here also yeah. we we have the weapon we have the swords of his word yes. <laughs> and that's that is something but yeah. but you know uh, what i would like to say chronologically in this chapter we should put this part of five verses to the end Mm. But I'm, I love this, that it's in the beginning, mm. because it shows the picture of those who stand on the side of Jesus, on the side of Christ. And suddenly we, we are coming to the message of warning and advice how to be in this group. Yeah, there, there, yeah. there is a final yeah. people of God that will be ready for his coming. And they, 
will be part of that greater <laughs> multitude, but there they are at the end and they're pictured and we can be part of that. Yeah. That's and, and if I may, just one sentence more. Uh, we as Adventists are usually underlying this message and we say, well, this is the last message, message the last warning from the side of God. So, so that's very important. And, and, you know, and it is. So it shows me again the great loving God who in this time, what is so desperate, so terrible, yeah. God is sending the message. Mm. So let's come to the three angels if we can. Uh, before we, we get to their messages as such, um, what is the role of the angels as we go through these, these three messages in a moment? The messenger. Okay, Somebody who conveys something, you know, what is extremely important, then that's the only reason that we send the messenger, that we send something special yeah. wants to announce. Mm -hmm. So we don't expect uh, uh, an angel appear on the sky and okay. proclaim a message. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's nothing about that. Yeah. Uh, it, it's a message that God has given us to, to proclaim to the world. So we, we actually have a part in, in sharing what is in these messages that we'll look at in a moment. Yeah. Each, each person in each age, you're talking three messengers, three messages specific for God's people. Yeah. So with each message, you become the angel or the messenger. You are the one that proclaims what that warning is. And, and it's actually interesting for, for the Greek mm. scholars there, you know, that, that Greek word angelos, it can be translated as it is into angel, but it can also be translated as messenger. messenger. Mm, and yeah. so that's where we get the, the thought from. Let's go <laughs> to the first of these three messages, and we're going to take the time to read through this. So this is in Revelation chapter 14 and verses 6 and 7, and it says there, Then I saw another angel flying in midair, and he had the eternal gospel to proclaim to those who live on the earth, to every nation, tribe, language, and people. He said in a loud voice, Fear God and give him glory, because the hour of his judgment has come. Worship him who made the heavens, the earth, the sea, and the springs of water. All right, what's the message of this first angel? It's a beautiful message, because there's a message of the eternal gospel. So that's the first, that's the, yes. that's the big shining light. And that for me, it's very important because the word of the word eternal, it means there is nothing new, nothing changed, as God is never changing. It's exactly the same. It shows at the same time that probably we as people, we forgot, we twisted it, we changed it. We have our own opinion, what we was last time, you know, we're mentioning it. That's, that's a danger. And that, that's so important. Well, probably we should elaborate a little more what is what it means gospel all right so let, let's do this sum up for me in one simple sentence what is the eternal gospel first of all the word gospel coming from uh, from greek means good news mm -hmm. so yeah. god has his good news that has never changed to proclaim to the whole world um, and we can we can interpret that as god's truth we interpret that the plan of salvation, that God has made a plan in, in His Son to die for us so that we can, we can have eternal life. Um, so, yeah, it, it can, it's, it's a package in, the, in that gospel. And, and, um, and then in the three messages, we see that package unraveled. So, so let me come back again, because you got more than one sentence in. <laughs> one sentence. What's the good news? Well, it's not a good advice what we should do. That's announcing once again what was done for every one of us. There Which is? One sentence. That's one sentence. Come on. What, <laughs> what, what is the good news, though? Christ died for us. He guaranteed the salvation for everyone if we'll accept it. Yeah. Christ died for us. He rose again. He lives to make intercession for us. Yes. He'll come back. He will come back. Yes. That's more than one sentence, so I, I didn't even <laughs> keep to that. Sorry about that. So, so what's, what does it mean by judgment? 
the hour of his judgment has come. Okay, good. Let's let's move to that. So when it says, so we've got the gospel, that's that's key, but you've got a couple of other elements there, judgment being one. Mm-hmm. What's the purpose of judgment? In Revelation, we in when we looked at chapters eight through to eleven, they were trumpets. And the trumpets are understood and we presented them as warnings that God was giving to mankind. Partial judgments. Partial judgments yeah. and that <coughs> and it is this one is suggesting that the time has come for God to bring a judgment on the world. And that judgment is part of Daniel's prophecies. Uh, We're connecting to Daniel 7 again. We're going back to Daniel. You can't escape Daniel when you look at Revelation. Yeah. In in Daniel, he was given a 2,300-day prophecy. Now, the 2,300-day was the overall prophecy, and he struggled to understand this. And the last session, we told you that in prophecy, a day is often represented as a year. So this was a 2,300-year prophecy, and when it was concluded, the angel who was explaining to Daniel its meaning said, it is for the time of the end. Hmm. So what is the time of the end? The time of the end, the time of all time prophecies, the end of all time prophecies is after 2,300 years or days. Okay, Raymond? Well, even we are talking about this hour of judgment that has come, so it shows it's not the main part of the of the message, first message. Because, you know, if it is eternal gospel that is delivered to all the world, yeah. so I'm sorry, judgment is not eternal because it has come. So it means it has the beginning and it, we know we will have also the end. Yes. Very important. But what is eternal here? Well, fear God. That's the first. So and yeah, I, I know you want to go on. Just before we, we go further on that, this fear God word, I think this is a meaning of a word that's changed over time. So does that mean I should shake in my boots and be terrified of God? Absolutely not. That's the, it means, you know, my respect to God, my loyalty to God, knowing God changes everything. But if I don't know, just mm-hmm. hear something about God, that's the result that I fear. Mm-hmm. But, so uh, I agree, that's not the proper, the, not the best word, but, but still it shows us that, that, you know, we have so many places in the Bible telling about the fear in God. But, mm-hmm. but, you know, always as we look at the context, it's just, look at me, who am I? Yeah, kind of yeah. Jesus is both lamb yes. and lion. It's yeah. Michael? I, I looked it up actually to, to see um, yeah. what are the meaning because as you said, the word fear can inspire um, something else than actually it's intended. Mm. And phobia, uh, the Greek word actually is suggesting um, uh, to revere, to be in awe, to pay allegiance, to pay allegiance to God. And I think that's where we have to look at because in in when we put chapter 13 and 14 together, and that's what it's meant to be, these two chapters, they go together. We find in in chapter 13, the whole world that worships the beast. And then God said, no, 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 you have to come and pay allegiance to me. And this is the reason. And we are given the reasons why God is inviting us to revere him, to worship him, to pay our allegiance to him and not to the beast. So that's a huge contrast going on here, isn't it? Mm. Correct. Um, the, there's, and so you, you've picked up on the, the idea of worship there. So you've got the, these elements. Now, obviously, this message is for everyone because to every nation, um, tribe, language and people. So this is not just for a little group of people or one church or, or you know, whatever it be. This is a global message. Correct. Um, the big message is the eternal gospel. It connects to judgment, but you've also got this final sentence there, you know, worship him who made the heavens, the earth, the sea, and the springs of water. You've talked about worship. What's going on with this final sentence? Why is this part of this first message? It brings us back to the commandments. 
Mm -hmm. Because in fact, that's that's a part of the fourth commandment, mm -hmm. and he's mentioning here what what most of the people on this earth completely lost: respecting God as God the Creator, understanding Him, and uh, and it's so important because salvation is a new creation. So it's extremely important for us that that we'll uh, will think about God as a creator who has the right to us. He knows us so well. He can recreate us. He can change us. That's salvation. So that's the second eternal element in this. Uh, there is a third one also. So what you're suggesting, Roman, is that when you look at the fourth commandment, you will find these words actually written exactly. in the fourth commandment. Yes. Exactly as they exactly. Here. Worship him who made the heavens and the earth. Yeah. So what's significant about that creation week? Can I explain how I might ex yeah. describe it to people? I say, I ask people, well, how long did God take to make the heavens and the earth? And when they think about it, they say six days. And I say, yes. But why did God add a seventh day to that sequence? What was God, why did God make it seven days rather than six days? Because on the seventh day, he actually rested with his creation. Yeah. He rested with Adam and Eve and all the animals that were created. They rested together. So God made that seventh day special. He set it apart from all other days. Yeah. And he made it a day of rest. Yeah. And if you rest on that day, you are acknowledging God as the creator. Mm. And I guess it then takes the next step, because if you connect it to Exodus 20, verses 8 to 11, with the, the commandments there, it's the one out of the ten that we forget, but it begins with the words, remember. Yeah. So remember the yeah. Sabbath day by keeping it holy. Six days you shall labour and seven the day of rest um, but yes that very you know you go to verse 11 and it echoes this very language and so if you connect worship now just because you worship on the seventh day doesn't mean you've got you it on the other days yeah. um, you, you still have to know Jesus and walk with him it's not a, a legalistic thing but it's a day <laughs> where we're set free from having to work our way through life. If God has the day, and we are his followers, so we should have also the day. <laughs> that's, that's so simple. It is and, simple. And, you know, and in fact, the whole religion is so simple, we complicated it completely. But if I may, just added the third element that is yeah. also eternal, let's give glory to him. In, in the Old Testament, mainly, and Isaiah especially is pointing our attention that, that we are created just to give glory to him. We should praise him all the time, uh, not only once in a week, not only all the time. And, and you know, that's, that's something extremely important. And, and you know, if the judgment is inside in between those three eternal, it means that it's very important that it's mentioned. It just helps us that a time now now to to practice this eternal elements because the judgment has come mm -hmm. Michael. the idea of judgment is never when it comes about the beast and the uh the dragon and <laughs> all the others we we don't find that uh there uh because you need to be on the right side you need to be on the right side when you call upon the judgment because the judgment is what brings everything to the surface so god says all right let's just bring everything to the surface and to see exactly what is happening here and he says i'm the creator i have created this world i have a right to actually ask these people to worship me because i'm the maker and and we see chapter 13 that actually this world has been hijacked uh, by by the, the dragon, by the beasts, and trying to take what actually belongs to him because we owe to our creator uh, a supreme loyalty, mm -hmm. all right? And, and the dragon is trying to, to uh, deceive us, to give our loyalty to him. And God says, no, no, that's not right. And let's just sit in the judgment to see how things 
uh, are. And in the judgment, it comes the idea of sacrifice, the idea that the Creator has paid, giving His Son to die for us, so that we can be... Which is good news. Which is amazing, which is fantastic. So it's just so much um, uh, incorporated in just this first message that we can... And, and, mm-hmm. and look, we have spent a little bit more time on this first message, and that's because it is an amazing message. I, I remember a number of years ago sitting with actually a, a, a young uni student, and he had asked me to study the Bible with him, and so we're sitting, studying together, and we got to this message. And when I'd finished it, he said, I see it. I said to him, what do you see? And he took a piece of paper and he said, here's the centre of the message. That's the eternal gospel, the eternal good news. And he said, how we respond to the eternal good news, the eternal gospel, that determines our judgment. In a sense, we judge ourselves, um, in a sense. And he said, that connects to worship because while the judgment is determined by our response to the gospel, our worship indicates how we have responded to the gospel. Mm. And I think it just draws those three elements together so neatly, and it's why that we can look at this as a single good news package. You know, judgment is only something to fear if we're on the wrong side of it, as you've said, Michael. Mm. Um, So this is a good news message. All right, you ready for the next one? This is the next message, folks. This is Revelation 14, verse 8. Short, punchy, um, maybe, maybe more of a warning than good news. The second angel followed, it says, and said, Fallen, fallen is Babylon the great, which made all the nations drink the maddening wine of her adulteries. All right. That's it. Message number two. I would say it's good news. Okay, why? You know, well, that's very simple. If, if there is a battlefield... And you know, two armies again, the military language, yes. and, and you know, and and we we suddenly the commander of of uh, of the army, the, this good army, victorious army, is just getting the message. Mm. Well, they are fallen already. Yeah, they, they are overcame. That's a warning. Yeah. So, so, so that's, that's something, you know, well, that's a warning for us now living, but at the same time, that's a good news because this side that I used to be, and it was a wrong side, it's fallen. I know it is. Mm-hmm. It's, they, they will be destroyed. In the context of what we were talking about before, the first, the first message, the first uh, special truth for for mankind was, judgment is coming. There was a warning of judgment. So when this judgment begins, the language in this second one is, Babylon is fallen. Mm. It's past tense. Mm. It's It's not present tense. So Babylon being fallen means it's defeated, is already known, and people need to understand that if they worship an enemy that is defeated, they are going to be judged because that... Yes, which is why by the time we get to Revelation 18, there's this final call, you know, yeah. get out of Babylon. And, and this is really what this is saying, isn't it? Yes. Um, yes. Okay, so, you know, Babylon, we talk about Babylon being, you know, false religion, um, rebellion against God, all those things. What about adultery? You know, the maddening wine of her adulteries. What's this symbolising? I think we, we can go back again to the Old Testament that gives the definition and we, we know that, <clears throat> we know that uh, the book of Revelation was, was written by a Jew, all right? Uh, and and uh, we've got all, all this information that comes in from the Old Testament that comes in the book of Revelation. We can't explain the book of Revelation without this concept. So we, we see many references in the Old Testament when the people of Israel... Um, turned away from God, it was considered as uh, as uh, as an adultery uh, in, in in having affairs with foreign gods, with other gods. Uh, so unfaithfulness 
to the truth, to the true God, is called adultery. So, so uh, here definitely it's a spiritual, spiritual adultery uh, of people that have been unfaithful to God, unfaithful to the everlasting gospel, and they followed what we studied last time in Revelation 13, a man-made doctrine. Uh, and the, this is the contrast. And God says, this system, uh, we look at the two beasts, especially the second beast, you know, bringing fire from heaven and doing all these miracles, fantastic. And God said, they are fallen. They are just a fake. <laughs> Don't follow them. Don't follow a system that is, has already lost. And man, when I want to join a cause, I don't want to join the cause of the losers. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and God says, these are the losers. Why would you join their cause when I'm the winner? Come and join me. But it's a, it's a long term. It's a del delayed gratification, isn't it? Because in the here and now, it may not be easy to, to walk the path yeah, that God has for us. Correct, correct. Yeah. That's true. And this is why we are giving a glimpse of the victory in the beginning, in chapter 7, to say, no, this is how it's going to look like. Uh, you'll be victorious if you join my cause. Don't, don't join the loser's cause. Yeah. It's raising the, the imagery <laughs> of a marriage, isn't it? Mm. That when, you, when you decide to give your heart to a particular partner, whether it's a male or female, you commit yourself to that person. But if somebody comes along and draws the attention of one of you, let's say yourself, away from that marriage, you're committing adultery. adultery. You're, you're joining with a prostitute. You're, you're joining with a harlot in, in, is the imagery that's used in Scripture. So God would rather you to know he is the God, the creator God, and have a relationship with him and not be caught in a deception and a counterfeit with the harlot. He's the lawful husband. Yes. Yeah. And when we go after other husbands or <coughs> other spouses, that's when the spiritual adultery takes place. So it's using, it's using language that underpinning it is this sense of faithfulness, that truth matters, that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. And these things are all pretty countercultural today. Mm. Let's come to the third angel's message. Uh, this is Revelation 14, verses 9 to 12. And it says there, A third angel followed them and said in a loud voice, If anyone worships the beast and its image and receives its mark on their forehead or on their hand, they too will drink the wine of God's fury, which has been poured full strength into the cup of his wrath. They'll be tormented with burning sulfur in the presence of the holy angels and of the Lamb, and the smoke of their torment will rise forever and ever. There'll be no rest, day or night, for those who worship the beast in its image or for anyone who receives the mark of its name. This calls for patient endurance on the part of the people of God who keep his commands and remain faithful to Jesus. What's the third angel's message in your words? I would say that uh, as a father, I remember as I tried to correct my children. So first I gave them something beautiful, some promises. Mm -hmm. Then I told them that you are on the wrong way. Absolutely. That's, it doesn't lead you to, to the end you want to receive. And if they didn't hear, I tried to warn them with all the results if they were going the wrong way. And that's, that's how I see God here. So that's the reason, uh, for me, the good news is in each of these messages. So it's actually because, words of love. Yeah, yes, I, I see God who is, who is a little bit impatient here. He says, wait a moment, I will explain once again, what, where does it lead, uh, this, this road that you are on? So remember it, just leave it, come out. I'm still waiting, I'm still waiting. Mm -hmm. And, mm -hmm. and, you know, this patience in the end, what you, what you read in, the, in this last verse of this, that's, that's so beautiful. It's, it, it gives me the picture of my God. 
And I'm so happy that, that you know, because the previous chapters, maybe they were just threatening with many, well, especially with the picture of Satan and, and what he does. Suddenly we, we can relax. Yes. All right. Good. Thank you. This v verse 12 actually ties together what we've been talking about, haven't it does, we? Yeah. It, it brings it all together. We were talking about the, the importance of the commandments and the fact that in the fourth commandment, you are guided back to that day of rest that God sanctified and set apart. Can, can I, I'm going to interrupt your flow here, Peter. Sorry. It actually does that in the verse before as well, because yes. here mm -hmm. you've got this commandment connection, the, the rest that we find in God, and the contrast is that those who have not gone the path of Christ can find no rest. That's right. Mm. They don't find rest and they, they struggle to, yes, they struggle to find peace. Yeah. But this ties, it, this commandment, uh, reference to commandment ties together everything we've been talking about. We've been talking about judgment. We've been talking about the 144,000 stay true to to God and understand the importance of what God asked us to do. And it reflects again in the fact, fact that God set aside one particular day. And if you, if you join with him on that day, you're at rest because you're, rest. Yeah. you're at rest with your creator yeah. and he's resting with you. Yeah, I think that's a, a beautiful thing. Can I ask also, and I don't know who wants to tackle this one, it talks in the previous verses there about the smoke of their torment. You know, some people have the idea that there's this forever torment that takes place. Now, I actually don't like that. I don't think it's there. But how would you, yeah, how would you tackle that concept? Yeah, um, but probably this is this is where many Bible commentators and readers they they just um, don't see the picture. Um, the bigger picture. So we'll probably come back to it when we discuss yeah, uh, Revelation chapter yeah. 20. Yeah. Um, but there are other Bible in the verse, uh, verses in the Bible that are suggesting the idea that everlasting, it doesn't mean infinity. It doesn't mean like time-wise forever. It's just till the end. It, it means that when, when that fire starts, uh, it will not stop until it has done its duty, yeah. all right? So like today, we're thinking of if we have a fire here in this building, what do we do? We call the triple zero and uh, the, the fire brigade will come and put off the fire. Mm -hmm. So if this fire that comes from God, that falls from heaven, as Revelation 20 tells us, all right, just call, call the triple zero and they will come and, you know, with a extinguisher, put, put up. That's nothing that human humans can do to put out the fire that comes from heaven uh, as a result of the final punishment, the final judgment that will take place. Um, so the fire continues to burn until it has finished, until everything ha is, uh, was brought to, to ashes. I, I remember as a kid, seeing a big plume of smoke rising up on the on the horizon we lived in perth at the time and wanting to go chase the smoke no we couldn't do that i you know picked up from school and then mum and dad wanted to or mum wanted to go to the shop so we jumped in the car headed to the shop the closer we got to the shops the closer the smoke became and we got to the shop there was no fire the shops were burned but there was still smoke drifting up in the sky signifying what had happened yeah. and i think yeah. you know that just a, a little illustration. Yeah. And, and then if I may say this, it has something to do with God's character. So we have discovered that actually all these messages are coming from the heart of a loving God. Yeah. So how we can reconcile this image, the heart of a loving God that gives warning um, uh, to the people so that we will make an informed decision whom we worship and on the other side that will will burn and torture and torment forever the creature that he the creatures that he has created for eternity it just it can't doesn't add up it doesn't add up you can't put them together uh, so we need to allow the bible to teach us that actually this teaching is not 
has not originated in the Bible, that has been introduced into the Christian uh, faith through the back door. Yeah. Uh, it has no, nothing to do with the teachings of the Bible. Yeah. Uh, if I may add something, you know, I met so many people in my life who were absolutely tormented because yeah. of the, uh, you know, and they were not able to fight or, or to lead the life as they should. And, and there was, the problem came, there was like a torment. The, the problem came, they didn't know how to do it. And they always called me, has to come. Maybe you will help. You know, they, they couldn't sleep at night. They couldn't, well, probably even every one of us had such moments that, you know, the problem was just taking completely the sleep from us, from our eyes. We couldn't rest. We didn't know what to do with ourselves. That's what he's talking. Mm -hmm. That's not the sentence done already and, and, you know, the end of time. That's a warning message. Mm. So, so we, have, we, we cannot forget about it. So this smoke is just a warning what will happen if. So, so we, we've got these three messages both trying to draw us to God, yeah. but also to warn us of the consequences of not taking that path. Yes. Yeah. You know, Revelation 13, we've got Satan, you know, being all about force. In Revelation 14, it's all about choice. God yeah. leaves yeah. choice. And so as you come to those closing verses of, of Revelation 14, uh, my Bible titles it The Harvest of the Earth. It gives us a just a picture of judgment. And... It, it parallels what's come before with these three angels. And so what we need to do now is to, to bring this, you know, to a close. Um, again, there's much more that we can dig into this. But Roman, let me start with you. As you look back on this chapter, what for you is the big message of Revelation 14? Well, that's a message of loving God. That's what I mentioned before. There's a message of God who, who could say, well, I have enough of them. Finish. Mm -hmm. In the last time, he's sending such a triple message to, to help us to understand. And, you know, with each angel, the message is more specific to, to make the whole picture. Uh, I see all the time this eternal gospel in it. And, and this good news, what God has done for me, not what he plans, maybe he will do or not. No, that, that's what I see all the time. I love this topic. I, I love to share with this because that's, that's something <clears throat> what, which tells me who is he. Mm -hmm. And well, maybe I should mention what I did before that, that you know, uh, it was last meeting. I remember that, you know, the first verse of this book tells us that this is the revelation of Jesus. Yeah. So we have it here. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks, mm. Peter. In Revelation 13, we were looking at the counterfeits that the beasts were involved in and the dragon was involved in. And then you've been mentioning that that was the darkened side. And then 14 is the, the light of God sort of shining the light on that to highlight the counterfeit and what the true path is. And for me, chapter 14 is a prelude to what is going to happen in 15 and 16. In our next vision, God is going to, or God in chapter 14 highlighted that Satan was going to use the threat of death to encourage people to turn to his side of... Encourage, yes. yes. Encourage. He's trying to encourage people to turn to his side, but the truth is not in the darkness. The truth is in the light. Yeah. And what God does is he highlights in chapter 14, if you are drawn into this threat of death that Satan is going to hang over your head, you will in fact be signing the judgment decree that if you follow him, you will not have eternal life. The eternal life is with the truth, with God. It's not with the threat of death, physical death with Satan. So it's 
it's do you want the truth or do you want to preserve your life in the way that Satan suggests you can? Okay, thank you. Michael, final thought. Yeah, um, we have everything to gain, nothing to lose. Uh, yeah, beautiful. When we join God's people, we follow him, we have nothing to lose. And I, I'm just amazed, you know, just reading that these two chapters should be enough to help us understand whom should we follow. Because in chapter 13, we see coercion. We see uh, we are forced. Uh, we are not able to sell and to buy. So that means we won't be able to buy food. We won't be able to. So these are the tools that Satan is using to force people to worship the beast. Uh, on the other side, God gives us freedom to choose. But he gives us the warning, and it's a stern warning, especially uh, the third uh, uh, message is a stern warning to convince us that the truth is on his side, the light is on his side, the freedom is on his side, eternal life is on his side. So it's just a beautiful message, a uh, message of a father that is very concerned of his children, and um, I choose to follow him. Thanks, Michael. We're going to pray and then we'll tell you about next week. Our Father in heaven, thank you that you are a God who loves us enough to give us the good news as well as warn us of what it means to reject that. Lord, we thank you for the eternal gospel, the eternal good news that we can choose you. And I just pray that as we consider these messages of revelation, we would indeed each choose Jesus, because the, this is the question upon which our eternal destiny revolves. So be with us as we go our separate ways now, we pray. May you guide us in all that we do, all that we read, and all that we say. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, next week we're going to be cover, covering two chapters, Revelation chapter 15 and 16. It's a picture of judgment and plagues. Do jump into your Bible and have a read of them before we meet together next time. God bless.